Studies have shown that minority communities in Canada experience higher rates of HIV AIDS infection, but stigmas surrounding the virus often make it difficult for those who need it most to access information and receive treatment. Henry Lulambia and Josephine Wong are with the Committee for Accessible AIDS Treatment. They have launched a project to help start dialogue in minority communities and help break down the stigma surrounding HIV, and they are joining me tonight in studio. Hello and welcome to both of you. Hello. Josephine, I'll start with you. Uh, sure. Explain what this program is and why there is a need for it. This is uh, an intervention study that we are launching. Uh, we are recruiting participants right now to start the project. The reason why we need this is because stigma uh, about HIV and homophobia and discrimination actually uh, continue to perpetuate silence in our communities. So even though our communities are affected by HIV and AIDS, very few people uh, talk about it, especially at low racial leaders. And that silence actually keeps us from doing effective HIV prevention work. I must admit, I'm shocked to hear that this day and age when we have been hearing about AIDS now for what, 25 years? Mm -hmm. Henry, you're nodding. Um, you came from Uganda. Yes. Tell us your experience and why you wanted to hook up with Josephine on this project. Uh, firstly, I'm living with HIV and uh, I was doing community HIV work back home in Uganda. But my arrival in Canada about six years ago, I found that uh, the situation here is a little different because people with HIV are not open enough uh, because of uh, various issues. They were more open back home? Uh, somehow, but here people are facing uh, other struggles from issues around racism, unemployment, and other social determinants of health. So that in top, uh, on top of HIV AIDS, it affects people from coming out, firstly to seek treatment, but also to seek testing. So that's why I'm, I'm involved in this study, because uh, we're trying to build HIV champions. People can speak about HIV, but not only people living with HIV, but like Josephina said, also community leaders from various sectors, faith, ethnic media, social justice, and uh, settlement uh, agencies. So talk to me a little bit more, both of you, about that silence that you describe and how it gets in the way. I think that is very challenging for racial minority communities in Canada because we are faced with many um, challenges on top of HIV. For instance, uh, the silence is because community members feel afraid that any talk about HIV will further stereotypes about each of the different communities because they encounter day-to-day -day challenges related to racism, unemployment. So that silence come about and it makes it even harder because when people don't talk about it, they're not going to seek any kind of testing. They're not going to seek any kind of support. And when they live in isolation, then that is one of the reasons why we found in recent studies that 40% of people who actually become infected got infected five years after they arrived Canada. After they arrived. After they arrived. I think that's important to mention because when we were discussing this interview before the show, we were wondering, if you come to Canada, do you have to share that, that health information before you arrive? Uh, well, the, the Canadian system uh, for the last uh, couple of years uh, requires everyone who is uh, an immigrant or a refugee to test uh, uh, routinely, and the tests include HIV. So uh, when Josephine talks about those uh, stud uh, the, the statistics, 40% of people are acquiring it when they've arrived here. So th th those are studies coming from uh, public health uh, of, of Ontario. But also we are seeing that through that routine testing that 20% of new HIV infections are from these newcomer communities. That's shocking. Mm -hmm. And uh, this provides us uh, uh, with a platform to do such uh, an intervention study because we're not uh, like any other research studies. Uh, we're trying to bring people living with HIV on board but also the community leaders uh, we provide them with skills because we're evaluating two intervention programs. One is called acceptance commitment therapy and also social justice capacity building. I think many people um, would look to you as a shining example of how you can live with this 
and still be healthy and still look well and, and, and do everything that someone with HIV AIDS does not have? Are people surprised when you tell them? They say, wow, you look fantastic. I guess uh, it all comes back to how about the general community? I can talk about my story, but not so many people out there in the community. But so you that's must inspire them. We are building champions and we need the dialogue. So uh, we believe if people can create that dialogue within their ethnic communities, within their leaders, so probably we'll see more people inspire others mm -hmm. in the various uh, uh, sectors, not only health. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we, we are bringing you know, on board settlement agencies, uh, faith leaders, where our newcomer communities seek support when they arrive. So that's why even the faith leaders, not only talking about the compassion, but acknowledging that HIV AIDS is an mm -hmm. issue and we need to work with these uh, communities to address it. How are you going to know if you are achieving what you set out to do? Our project is actually quite complex in some way and this is one of the reasons why we're really happy to be here. We're hoping that this interview will motivate our leaders in the communities, whether they are living with HIV or they're not, to come on board. Um, the two interventions, the social justice capacity building and the acceptance commitment training, actually have been used to address other health issues, including depression, addiction, uh, people who are actually struggling with many of the social and health issues. So this is a project in which we'll do pre-intervention surveys and focus group. And then after that, we will also repeat the survey and the focus group. And how so, long was the, will this go on for? This actually will go on for two and a half years mm -hmm. and we'll be following, but we don't want to scare off potential participants. The training itself would take anywhere from 10 to 12 hours for each of the intervention, but afterwards we connect with them. Everybody would get together and our research associate would call them and find out whether they were able to apply what they learned yeah. in the communities. Josephine Wong and Henry Luyambia, I think I got it right. She did. Thank you both for being with us. We really appreciate it. We're going to have you. to take a quick break. We'll be back with our health headlines straight ahead.